LGBT rights are human rights. We know. Professor Gillian Triggs is also very much aware. Gillian is the president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, taking up her appointment by the Commonwealth Attorney General in 2012. She was Dean of the Faculty of Law and Chalice Professor of International Law at the University of Sydney from 2007 to 2012, and Director of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law from 2005 to 2007. Please welcome Professor Gillian Triggs. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that terrific welcome. It really makes a difference to me to be able to come into um, a group uh, such as this um, uh, and receive such a, such a warm welcome, a little bit like uh, Auntie Matilda. I'm not an elder and I didn't get off at a cup of tea, but uh, the clap <laughs> was really lovely. Um, but thank you, Auntie Matilda, for that, uh, that wonderful welcome. I think it's one of the best welcomes to country I've heard. Um, and I think she'd make a living as a stand-up comic, actually. She's very funny and very warm, and she, she got us all going. And a wonderful presentation, if I may say so, from the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders, LGBTI uh, groups. Um, just wonderful to understand the depth and individuality of, uh, of the concerns that we all have to be sure that we have equal rights. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Smith. I know you have to go. Um, but uh, I think we all greatly admire your very measured... Um, uh, journey, really, to reach the view that you are now standing for, uh, and I think your leadership position is going to be very important in the coming months and, and years, uh, but it's one that I think we all deeply appreciate, so thank you very much, and thank you, Susan, for, uh, for inviting me uh, to this Health and Wellbeing uh, Conference. The theme, of course, is working together um, in relation to health and wellbeing, and that's really where the Australian Human Rights Commission comes into the game, because we hope that we can make some sort of contribution to your considerations about what the health and well-being issues are uh, in relation to LGBTI rights. Um, what I'd like to do today is to take you on really quite a complicated, if I may, legal journey uh, to look at what are the international human rights that underpin everything that you are asking for. Um, so if you, if you will hold on to your seats a little, I'll take you some, through some of the international legal principles that, that are so critical to achieving the outcomes of equality uh, that we want to achieve. I'm going to talk a little bit about marriage equality and health, and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the, um, how we got to this question and the extraordinary and inspirational views of the majority of the United, uh, United States Supreme Court in their recent decision. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the role of the Australian Human Rights Commission, what we do and, and how we work, uh, and then to look at some recent research that we've undertaken entitled Resilient Individuals, uh, National Consultation uh, on Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity and Intersex Rights. So perhaps, um, if I may, we could begin with what is the international law? Um, and we begin really of quite a long time ago, in 1946, with the World Health Organization. And their um, view, soon after the Second World War, that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical mental, and mental health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, and political belief, economic and social condition. And that was picked up in 1948 with the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and Article 2. And can I remind you that a quite remarkable Australian, Doc Evatt, uh, was the rather feisty uh, man with a strong vision who absolutely was determined that under his presidency of the General Assembly, this Universal Declaration was going to get through as it did without a single negative vote. Um, the Universal Declaration that everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in the Declaration without distinction of any kind, such as sex, birth, or other status. And that concept of other status has been interpreted ever since 
as including sexual orientation and gender identity. But then it's picked up in the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1966, to which Australia is a ratified party, but which sadly has never been introduced into Australian law as a direct source of law, but it remains an international obligation to which we're party. And in particular, Article 17, guaranteeing the right to privacy, and Article 26, that critical provision, all persons are equal before the law. And there are other rights, of course, in human rights law, access to information, the right to participation, and the right, for example, to benefit from science. But one of the areas that we're concerned about is the right, of course, here, to the right to health. And in health, it's more than necessarily physical manifestations, as we've already heard this morning. But it also, we need to look at the underlying causes of health inequality, the social determinants of good health, and LGBTI uh, rights to mental health uh, that arise uh, from their particular status, from isolation. We've heard about the problems of remote and regional areas um, of minority groups generally, and the very um, sad statistics on uh, uh, LGBTI suicide. But let's have a look at what's happened to the law since those very early days of the 40s after the Second World War and the development of the International Covenant. Because we have some of the major committees uh, um, and courts throughout the world giving some legal substance to what we mean by these rather broad, abstract ideas. And one of the cases that I, I think you'll all be aware of is the United Nations Human Rights Committee decision in Tunan and Australia. And this does in particular involve the Tasmanians, because you might remember, of course, that it was Tasmania that had maintained the uh, laws that criminalised uh, uh, homosexual acts between consenting adults, even in private. And it was one of those interesting cases where the Commonwealth government was unhappy with this Tasmanian law, uh, but it remained on the books. A complaint was brought by a young man, Tunan, directly to the Human Rights Committee in the United Nations, which legally uh, individuals are entitled to do in Australia. Um, and he argued that this was a breach of the privacy provisions in the International Covenant, Article 17, and a breach of the right to equality before the law. And the Human Rights Committee, uh, in particular, emphasised Article 17, the right to privacy between consenting adults in private. Uh, it was essential uh, that those um, rights between uh, gay couples should be respected. The um, Tasmanian government rejected this, but of course it now gave the Commonwealth the power to ensure that as a matter of national legislation, um, uh, that a conflicting state law was now invalid. And that really eliminated the last of the formal legal discriminatory provisions against, um, against uh, uh, homosexual couples. But the other one, and Australia has led the way in bringing some of these cases before the United Nations, is Young and Australia. And this was a case in which um, there was a relationship um, between uh, Larry Kane for 30 years with Young. Uh, and Larry Kane was a World War II veteran. But when it came to claiming the pension on, on Mr. Kane's death, uh, the uh, Commonwealth denied that payment and said that the payment would be entitled only to partners of the opposite sex uh, under the Veterans Entitlement Act. And he, uh, of course, challenged that and went to the Human Rights Committee, which found uh, that the restriction violated the equal rights laws under the International Covenant um, and, of course, the privacy laws. The Australian government rejected those findings, as it typically does, I might add, in the general human rights area. Um, but, but we had to wait until a change of government in 2007 when that provision under the Veterans Entitlement Act was changed. Now, I've gone through a couple of those examples, and there are, there are, there are some others, but basically to say, just as Senator Smith has said, this has been a journey, and it's a slow journey. It's not been easy to bring the law behind what we all know to be a fact about, um, about LGBTI um, uh, sexual orientations and, and, and choices. Um, and that's particularly reflected in the United Nations itself. Um, statements of the General Assembly and Human Rights Councils as recently, and the first ones in fact, as recently as 2008, have not yet been adopted even as resolutions. But 
Curiously, given the deep prejudice against uh, um, LGBTI rights in Africa, South Africa led the charge in the uh, Human Rights Council in June 2011 requesting that uh, the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights reports on violations of LGBTI rights should be followed up and implemented. And that led to the first successful resolution on LGBTI rights in the uh, Human Rights Council, which was passed 23 votes to 19 with three abstentions. But you can see how close these are, but it was nonetheless passed. And in September 2014, the Human Rights Council adopted another resolution expressing their grave concern for violence and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, and in 2015, this year, the Human Rights High Commissioner reported again uh, a second UN official report on the concerns they had about the discriminatory treatment um, of those of a different sexual orientation or gender identity. But one of the difficulties in the UN context is a very strong move against these resolutions, uh, partly by uh, Arab states, but in particular by Russia, which has frequently uh, introduced a special resolution to confirm uh, traditional values. And this is proving to be a difficult battle in the UN. But I, again, wanted to introduce these uh, these. Um, efforts to you to indicate to you how relatively recent and how raw and uh, unsophisticated uh, we are at the moment uh, in the United Nations context in giving effect to LGBTI rights. Um, but now I'd like to move to the, the question of uh, marriage equality uh, because this has been a, a fascinating um, a journey in its own right. Um, this cartoon shows you uh, what the level of support for gay marriage has been in the Australian community, and it's been very high indeed. Um, uh, and it's been extraordinary in a way that the acceptance that we find in the Australian Human Rights Commission in the general Australian community is not reflected at the political level. Um, this is a rather marvellous cartoon. You might uh, know the, the, the um, group called the Defence of Marriage Act uh, was struck down by the United States Supreme Court. And this is a wonderful uh, illustration of, um, of justice and law uh, embracing the statute uh, of liberty, uh, the implication being that they would very much like to have married. Um, but what is really critical has been this United States Supreme Court decision. They are, of course, leaders in the development of global jurisprudence, but also helps in that UN process, uh, sadly, of course, uh, in, a, in a contested environment with Arab states and many of the socialist states. Um, but I thought it worth mentioning, at least, this remarkable decision, um, Obergefell against Hodges. Um, it was um, a majority decision of the United States Supreme Court, and it struck down state laws that prohibited gay marriage. But what is important about this uh, majority decision is reading it. And I do urge you, and I know many of you would not be lawyers in this, uh, in this audience, but I do urge you to read it because it provides a really wonderful uh, a description of why um, acceptance of gay marriage uh, is justified and should be, should be um, developed. The uh, court took the view that marriage is not an immutable concept, but changes with the social environment and community expectations in relation to the noble purpose of marriage uh, should be recognized by that court. Uh, it adopted the language of the 14th Amendment that no state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due access to the law, and concluded that it's a fundamental liberty uh, to marry, and that applies equally to same-sex couples. The court looked at four principles that they said underpin that interpretation of the American 14th Amendment. One was the right to choice. The other was the unique union of two people. Um, a third was the need to protect children within the family environment, and fourth, was the recognition that marriage is the keystone for social order. And I'd just like to read you an extract of that court decision, because the court said, marriage fulfills yearnings for security, safe haven, and connection that express our common human humanity. Civil marriage is an esteemed institution, and the decision whether and to whom uh, uh, to marry is among life's momentous acts of self-definition. So it's an, it's an inspiring 
uh, judgment, and one that also goes back into the history, because uh, one has to put things in a historical context uh, that I remember, of course, as a law student in the 60s. Uh, the marriage between different races in America uh, was banned. Um, uh, marriage uh, by a person, a man who perhaps hadn't paid his childcare uh, was banned. Uh, uh, marriage in different states was controlled in different ways. Uh, women were seen as very secondary in a marriage. Contraception was banned in a number of states, even in the context of marriage. So when we realize how the law has in fact finally caught up, uh, it's been interesting to see uh, the, the spirit in which the United States Supreme Court has now embraced marriage equality as, as a fundamental aspect of liberty within the United States Constitution. Well, of course, one of the very great difficulties for Australia is that we do not have constitutional rights that will protect uh, and can provide a benchmark for our courts to give judgments of this kind. And that's a very real problem that I'll come to in a moment. But I thought you might be interested in this um, uh, 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 map, which shows where same-sex marriage is uh, legal, uh, where it might depend on particular states, and you can see obviously in the United States initially, that will now change of course with the uh, United States decision, um, and those states where uh, marriage is not permitted, and they are relatively few, and you can see Australia there joins um, Eastern Europe um, and, uh, and a very, very few other states in denying the right to gay marriage. Um, and that then brings me to what I wanted to talk to you about in particular today is the role of the Australian Human Rights Commission. And I thought I might tell you a little bit about what we are. Uh, we are a national human rights body. There are 110 such bodies in the world. And the Australian Human Rights Commission has an A status within the United Nations Paris Principles. Um, we have independence, we're paid for by the taxpayer, um, but we are appointed by the Governor-General, at least I as President and our Commissioners. But here we come to a, a point, um, and perhaps I should go back, here we come to a point that's perhaps not entirely understood in Australia, and it's at a point uh, that really confirms the exceptional and in, indeed unique uh, status of human rights within Australia and why it's so difficult for us to get a court decision such as the United States Supreme Court decision. Um, and that is that the, 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 the uh, benchmark for determining human rights for the Commission is international law and the, in particular the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the ILO, a relevant ILO convention, and our Australian legislation on race, sex, disability, and age. But much of the human rights law that I've been talking about in relation to um, LGBTI rights uh, cannot be directly applied in Australia because those laws have never been given uh, domestic implementation. So if I were to go to the High Court of Australia and argue for Article 17 and Article 26 of that convention, I would simply be told, well, that's very interesting as a matter of comparative law. Uh, it's very interesting that Australia is bound by these provisions in the international environment, but it has no direct relevance from the point of view of applying that law in Australia. Um, as I said a moment ago, we also have very few constitutional provisions to appeal to. We have a right to vote, we have a right to freedom of religion, we have a right to be compensated if our property is taken from us, but we have no other general descriptions of liberty or freedoms uh, that other countries take for granted. We have no charter or bill of rights, um, and we have very little legislation other than the legislation that I have described. Um, but in that context, nonetheless, uh, the Human Rights Commission deals with about 20,000 inquiries and formal complaints a year, of which we settle uh, and conciliate about 70%. Um, uh, you must come to the Commission before you can go to the Federal Court, and very few do. Uh, and uh, in the few that go to the Federal Court, we've never been overturned on a substantive provi uh, provision of law. Uh, now we come to the Sex Discrimination Act itself, and that uh, is one where uh, LGBTI complaints can be made. And we have relatively few complaints coming to the Commission under, uh, in relation to uh, LGBTI rights, um, but, we are the, but the numbers are growing. And the kinds of uh, problems, just to give you an example, that we are dealing with now increasingly, 
um, are various forms of discrimination are now protected under the Sex Discrimination Act that might be the HIV insurance example um, where a young man um, with HIV positive was unable to get insurance to travel. And he raised that with the Human Rights Commission. We invited the company to come into the commission to uh, um, allow us to conciliate the matter. And uh, that company agreed uh, that this was discriminatory, uh, not to provide an opportunity for insurance. It affected the ability to travel, but it could affect all sorts of other things, work rights, superannuation, and so on. And the company agreed that this was inappropriate. They've changed their policies and now, indeed, have generated more business by becoming known as being um, LGBTI friendly and offering opportunities for insurance. Um, other examples are uh, where um, people might have made a transgender change from male to female, but have refused the right to update their personal details. We will typically try to conciliate those um, those uh, uh, breaches of the law uh, and thereby achieve some systemic change within uh, particularly the business community. Um, I did mention that we've had a change to the law. I think you'll all be aware uh, that a couple of years ago the Sex Discrimination Act was amended to include um, uh, sexual orientation. Uh, that was an extraordinary exercise. We, you might recall that the former government was hoping to consolidate all of the legislation that I've just been describing, along with the international legal principles to which we're party, um, in, a, in, a, in a big consolidation act. Included in it was the uh, addition of sexual orientation as a protected attribute um, within the Sex Discrimination Act. Now, you'll all be aware that the consolidation exercise uh, completely failed. The then Attorney General decided not to go forward with, the, with that consolidation. But there was an agreement that it would go forward with, the, with regard to sexual orientation. And I was rather concerned at the time. I thought maybe that would not be something that the Australian public would be willing to accept. But, but to my complete surprise, it went through with, with, um, with very little public discussion, and in fact, I think is not even understood much within the Australian community, that it is an example of where the law is slow to catch up with community behaviour and, uh, and, and community, uh, community acceptance. And our experience in the Human Rights Commission has been that the Australian community generally is very accepting of the obligation not to discriminate on the grounds of, at least, of sexual orientation. But I would also like to point out a very extraordinary phenomenon that happened at the same time, and that is that for the last 36 years or so, uh, we have, a, uh, in, our le in legislation, there have been numerous exceptions for uh, faith-based organizations, for the major religions, to be able to be excluded from laws uh, which would make them liable for discrimination on a number of grounds, but in this context, um, a sexual orientation. However, it was agreed uh, that this exception would be taken away in relation to religious organizations that provide aged care facilities. And some of you will be aware that um, overwhelmingly, aged care facilities are actually provided by the faith-based communities which means that they are the ones most likely uh, to be in a position to po possibly refuse uh, aged care facilities uh, to people uh, of the same sex or a different sexual orientation uh, or identity, uh, which was, of course, invidious. Uh, and again, to our surprise, it was possible to get that exception to the exception through the legislation so that now if you're receiving public funds and offering aged care facilities, you can no longer claim an exemption on religious grounds. You are bound to meet the standards of the rest of the international community. Um, that's a big leap forward. Um, again, it's not much understood in the community, but I think we're going to see more debate about the intersection between the explicit right to freedom of religion in the Constitution and the kinds of rights that we're talking about here. Um, but now I'd like to show you something very different, and I'm really doing this um, by way of ex ex uh, exploring just how uh, important the global uh, context is. Um, this is a, a video that we prepared uh, at the request of what used to be known as the British Commonwealth of Nations, now the Commonwealth of Nations, and Australia chaired it. And as president of the Human Rights Commission, I was able to chair this agreement, this, uh, this committee. And it was agreed that we will be funded 
to provide um, a, an LGBTI uh, a video uh, on their rights for the African community. Uh, now, this was a really, really difficult thing to take on because, as many of you will know, uh, the African continent um, has uh, a very strong, largely religious-based objection to uh, LGBTI rights, will not recognize them, and there is a great deal of violence and discrimination uh, of, of a very high level, and perhaps that explains the courage of South Africa in taking the resolution, uh, resolutions forward to the United Nations. But I, th I wonder if we could just start this, uh, this video, if possible. When Kojo and Soji were young, it was simple. But as they grew, it seemed less simple. Being in love meant one thing to their parents or friends, but to them it meant something different. Sometimes it made them feel good, but it also made them feel confused, guilty, and sometimes worse. They got good at pretending. They had terrible stories about what could happen if they let their secret slip. This is Soji's story, but it's many others too. In some parts of Africa, there are inspiring laws and constitutions that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. But despite this, the practice of corrective rape is common in some of these countries where men rape lesbian and bisexual women to try to cure them of their sexual orientation. In other parts of Africa, prosecutions for same-sex conduct have been steadily increasing. One man was jailed after just sending a text to another man. He died in jail from malnutrition and repeated assaults. In one country, a local paper outed 200 people who were supporters of same-sex rights, exposing them to abuse, attacks, eviction from their homes and dismissal from their jobs. Human rights defenders who work to protect victims of same-sex discrimination are beaten and publicly ridiculed. But how does this story end? In May 2014, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, alarmed by these acts of violence and discrimination against people because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, and by their failure to investigate and prosecute perpetrators of such human rights violations called on African states to end this abuse and extend the equal protection of the law to every individual, irrespective of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Help us spread Soji's story. Every person in Africa should have the right to love whoever they want, the right to dignity, the right to non-discrimination, the right to be free and equal. Thank you. And perhaps we could go back to the, the PowerPoint just very briefly, if, if that's possible. There we go. Um, so that is, uh, that is a start for work at the global level. Um, and, and as, as uh, Dean Smith has said, this, we're all in this together. We've all got to work together, but there are certainly some parts of the world where there, there is a great deal of work to be done, and uh, the, the evidence of, of violence and discrimination is really very distressing, uh, particularly in the African continent. So I hope that work of this kind can start to uh, create a different environment. And you'll see the, the booklet that's described there is in fact a cartoon, um, a comic, uh, which is, I think, a way of getting to, um, to the wider community in Africa. So please do ask me if you'd like a copy of it, and I can make sure you, you get it. Um, but I'd like to conclude, if I may, by looking at um, the uh, work that we do through our uh, inquiries. And some years ago, we had a, an inquiry, same sex, same entitlements, uh, in relation to Commonwealth laws, and the following year, in 2008, the government amended 84 laws that discriminated against same-sex couples and their children. And that applied across the spectrum, tax, uh, social security, employment, Medicare, veterans affairs, superannuation, workers' compensation, and family law. Um, but there, as you will all know, is a lot further to go. And 
Um, one of the things that the new uh, commissioner appointed to the Human Rights Commissioner, Tim Wilson, wanted to do uh, was to learn across Australia what the real concerns were and to start to get uh, some data uh, in terms of discrimination. And uh, he led this nationwide consultation. Uh, he uh, conducted an online survey, uh, meetings uh, through foreign groups around Australia, and received 30 written submissions. And the findings were, in short, of significant discriminations uh, against LGBTI peoples. 75% uh, experienced bullying on the basis of their status. 90% know somebody who had experienced bullying, harassment, or violence, or bias on, on the basis of their sexual orientation and status. Uh, it was clear that there are lower health outcomes for LGBTI Australians. Um, and an assumption that patients are heterosexual, that they're partnered or they're married. There are also conscious and unconscious biases, especially with regard to lesbian women. It's assumed that their health needs are exactly the same as heterosexual women. Uh, uh, more than half, in fact, uh, said that they were extremely uncomfortable in the healthcare context in disclosing their sexual orientation and that they're almost invariably asked uh, questions uh, that would never be asked of a heterosexual person and that make them uh, quite uncomfortable, primarily because the people asking the questions lack training and cannot offer appropriate care or respond appropriately to the kinds of questions that are being asked. And the kinds of um, submissions that we received at the Commission are summed up in these words, we're normal and we deserved to be treated as such. Now, we have a full report. Uh, all the data is in that report. I won't uh, take you through it, but it was a damning picture. And what it's done is to uh, confirm uh, in our mind that there is a very significant lack of reliable data, particularly about intersex people in Australia. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence um, about the impact of unjust discrimination, uh, uh, particularly in employment, but uh, for the purposes of today's conference, very noticeable in the healthcare sector. Uh, we're particularly concerned about unnecessary surgery on intersex children in the absence of the uh, informed uh, consent of their parents. And we're also concerned about the classification of intersex in infants as a third sex or as indeterminate. But what it has done is led us to begin a new project, and that will begin in the next uh, month or so, on education in clinical mental health curriculums and to adopt a gap analysis. Some of you may be aware that we um, chair and run the Close the Gap um, uh, project for the government for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, that's been, as the Prime Minister has said, disappointing, uh, but it has been uh, rather more successful in the healthcare area, and we're hoping to adopt the gap analysis to close the gap in relation to health with regard to LGBTI uh, people in relation to mental health. So that's our next uh, project, and we hope that that will give some assistance to specialist clinical mental health practitioners in the future. So in conclusion, um, assessing health uh, uh, through the prism of human rights does strengthen the ability to promote the health and well-being of LGBTI people. Uh, the recent work of the Commission can highlight the changes that are needed to provide equality of health care, but most particularly the need for better research and data which focuses on LGBTI health rights. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy what is a remarkable uh, conference over the next three days. Thank you. Thank you very much.